Okay, I'm going to talk you through theme one of the EDUCAS RS A level, A2, um, and this is the Christianity section of the course. Very first theme that we look at, and this is the birth of Jesus, and in particular, nativity stories. So, in the New Testament, the story of Jesus is told in the four Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, both Mark and John do not mention Jesus' birth at all and instead start his ministry with his baptism round about the age of 30 by John the Baptist. However, Matthew and Luke both contain a nativity story and for the purposes of the A-level you need to understand the differences between the two stories, the similarities and then need to be able to give a cogent argument as to whether the differences mean that the two cannot be harmonized or whether the similarities allow you to do just that and that's what we'll be looking at in this section you need to be very familiar with the birth stories in both Matthew and Luke you have them in your set texts you're not expected to quote both Matthew and Luke chapters 1 and 2 but you are expected to have an in-depth knowledge of what is said in both those passages. So as I've said previously, the Gospel of Mark, the first Gospel uh, that most historians uh, believe was written, does not contain any birth narrative whatsoever. It starts with a baptism and the Gospel of John, the last to be written, as most theologians would say, also does not contain any nativity, any birth narrative. So actually what we find is, and, and you'll have found this in the lesson we did, that our knowledge of what occurred in the nativity story is very much clouded by our own cultural view. The, how we celebrate Christmas, uh, the ideas that we have, what we see on postcards, what we see in nativity scenes, makes us think that what we see there is actually what happened in the Bible stories. Uh, actually, it couldn't be further from the truth. What you, we've got is an amalgamation of the two, when in fact the reality is there's very, there's very little that both gospel accounts uh, agree on. So it's very different. So let's have a look at this. So as I've mentioned, there are many significant differences between the account in Matthew and the account in Luke, the Matthean and the Lucan accounts. And these are really um, the only commonalities that you could say. These are the only things that really appear in both as key ideas and themes. So Mary, Joseph and Jesus obviously appear in both Matthew and Luke. We get the supporting characters of the angels and the Holy Spirit. They are also there. The titles attributed to Jesus, namely Christ, son of David, they appear in both Matthew and Luke and there's a key link to the heritage of Jesus through genealogies, through family trees, uh, this idea of being related to David, the um, seen by the Jews as the ideal king, uh, children of Abraham, the covenant with Abraham, the family tree going all the way back to Adam. And the places are similar, Nazareth in Galilee, in the north of the country, and Bethlehem in Judea, in the south of the country, just to the south of Jerusalem. And both um, Gospels also place the birth of Jesus during the reign of King Herod. However, there are some major differences in both of the storylines. So let's look at these now. And what I've done is I've divided these into a different heading. So the first difference you could look at is different places. So in Luke's Gospel, we hear that Mary and Joseph are actually natives of Galilee. So they are natives of the north of the country. They travel to Bethlehem uh, because of a Roman census. The newborn Jesus is placed in a manger because there's no room for, the, for them in the inn. Also be in, um, it should be noted that at no stage in either gospel account is a, a, is a um, stable mentioned. But the fact that he's placed in a manger leads some people to believe that they gave birth in a stable. But 
it isn't mentioned in Luke's Gospel at all. It certainly isn't mentioned in Matthew's Gospel, who actually makes no mention of a manger, no mention of an inn, and says that Jesus was born in a house. But anyway, um, so in Luke's account, Mary and Joseph are native Galileans. They travel to Bethlehem, so they go south for the census. Jesus, uh, they give birth and Jesus is placed in a manger. They then return home to Nazareth, stopping at the temple in Jerusalem on the way. However, in Matthew's gospel, Joseph and Mary are introduced as natives of Bethlehem, so to the south of the country. There they reside in a house after the birth due to Herod slaughtering the um, innocents, the firstborn children. They flee to Egypt to, to escape Herod and afterwards, when they return, following the death of Herod, they relocate to Galilee. So two different ideas from the two gospel writers on place. The next difference concerns the people in the account. So Luke repeatedly compares Jesus with John the baptizer. We hear the whole story of um, John's birth, etc. Um, and he's not really mentioned in Matthew's, well, he's not really mentioned, he's not mentioned in Matthew's infancy accounts at all. In Matthew's narrative, Jesus' birth is detected by foreign priests, the Magi, also the, what are called the wise men. In Luke, there are no Magi, there are just the shepherds. In Matthew's, the shepherds do not appear. It's also interesting to note that in, neither, in um, Matthew's Gospel, there is actually no mention that there are three magi. There could have been one, there could have been two. Well, there would have been more than one because it says there were there was men, wise men, plural. But there could have been three, four, five, six, seven. The reality is the reason we come at the idea of three magi is that there were three gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And that's the only reason why we've got three magi. But the number is never actually stipulated at all in the gospel account. And as I said, Luke, no magi at all just shepherds. So if we think of our crib scenes, this would be a crib scene from Matthew's Gospel. So Magi, Joseph, Mary and baby. And this is going to be much more seen from Luke's Gospel. Shepherds, manger and various farm animals about. Although again, as I said, the stable is not mentioned. So as well as the different people, we can look at the different attitudes behind the two Gospels. And this is where we start to dig a little deeper. And it's this aspect that you really need to be familiar with for this part of the course. So if we look at the attitudes in Matthew's narrative, we've got King Herod in Jerusalem hunting throughout the region for the infant Jesus to kill him. In Luke's narrative, however, uh, there's no mention of this whatsoever. And as opposed to Matthew's gospel, where uh, Mary and Joseph and the newborn baby have to hide from Herod, they avoid Jerusalem, they flee to Egypt. In Luke's narrative, nothing can be further from the truth. The child is actually publicly proclaimed in the heart of Jerusalem by Simeon and Anna. So there's no mention of the slaughter of the innocents whatsoever. And really, Luke is portraying Jesus' family as, as observantly going to Jerusalem. But in Matthew, they avoid the city. And of course, observantly going to Jerusalem would be for the bris, the circumcision of the young child. The other major differences concern the features of the two Gospels. So in Matthew's narrative, it's really clear that the main protagonist of the Gospel there is Joseph. He concentrates on him. It's Joseph that receives the message from the angel in a dream. Note that the angel is not named in Matthew's account. In Luke's account, however, totally flipped on its, on its head, and it's Mary who is the key protagonist at the start, the one who hears God, who keeps God's word, who sings the hymn, the Magnificat. And the angel that appears to Mary is, uh, is named, is named as the angel Gabriel. And the angel, appear, angel Gabriel appears to Mary while she's awake, whereas in Matthew's account, it's in a dream. And as I mentioned before, Luke's narrative includes a number of unique songs or canticles. These are the Magnificat, the Benedictus and the Nunc Dimittis. Whereas Matthew is much more concerned with quoting Old Testament passages and showing that Jesus fulfills these Old Testament passages. The Old Testament passages that Matthew alludes to are those uh, that tell the coming of the Messiah for the Jews. 
And what Matthew's at pains to do is show that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised by God to the Jews. Matthew starts his infancy narrative with a genealogy, a family tree of Jesus from Abraham down to Joseph and Mary. Luke's genealogy actually doesn't appear till the start of his ministry, so just before his baptism under John the Baptist, and that runs backwards from Joseph to Adam. So what I've done here is I've um, put the content of the two um, nativity accounts side by side so you can clearly see the difference. And the first thing I point out is actually the big difference between the two accounts. Matthew is only 48 verses, including the genealogy, which is um, quite in depth. Whereas Luke has a total of 132 verses plus another 16 for the genealogy. So let's look at the things that are similar and the things that are different. As I've mentioned before, in Matthew, it's an unnamed angel that appears to Joseph in a dream announcing Jesus' birth. In Luke, it's the angel Gabriel who announces Jesus' birth to Mary while she's awake. We then see Mary visiting Elizabeth and Mary's hymn, the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. We then in Luke, have the story of John the Baptist's birth with Elizabeth. We have his circumcision and another hymn, the Benedictus from Zechariah. And then we have Joseph and Mary's journey to Bethlehem for the census. None of this is mentioned in Matthew's gospel whatsoever. In Matthew's gospel, Mary's son's born in Bethlehem and named Jesus in a house. In Luke's gospel, Mary gives birth to a son in Bethlehem in Judea and this child is laid in a manger. We then move through to the shepherds, where the angels appear to the shepherds and sing the Gloria, glory to God in the highest, etc. So following that, the shepherds visit Mary, Joseph and the infant lying in a manger in Luke. The infant is circumcised and named Jesus and is presented to God in the temple, where Simeon, who was, um, it was foretold that he would see the Messiah before he died, sings the Nunc Dimittis, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And then Luke's gospel finishes by um, the family returning back to Nazareth. Matthew, however, doesn't mention any of Simeon and the Nunc Dimittis. He doesn't mention anything about the circumcision, no shepherds, but instead when we pick up the story of the Magi from the East coming, visiting Herod and then visiting Jesus in a house. And then Joseph and Mary flee to Egypt after the angel visits Joseph with the child Jesus. And then we get the story of Herod and the murder of the innocents. And finally, the Holy Family return to Israel when all is safe and then journey to Nazareth. Now, one of the things you could look at actually is there's no time scale given to the uh, visit of the Magi. And many theologians have actually said, well, it, it's quite possible that this visit actually occurred a couple of years after the birth of Jesus. And actually there's no reason, um, there's no clear reason in the Bible for that not being the case, and neither for being the case. It's a matter of opinion. You make up your own mind on it. The other thing I've done is looked at the two different emphases of the two gospels. And I think you can divide these up into six different key things. So in Matthew, his driving force behind his writing is the idea that scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures are being fulfilled. And I've put the ref references in there for you to look at in more detail. And I think Luke is his driving force is much more that the Holy Spirit is at work here. And there are the key verses for you to look at and see as evidence for that. Jesus's heritage is stressed by both authors. Matthew is very much about talking about Jesus being the son of David, the legal son of Joseph, but a child of the Holy Spirit. Luke talks more about the son of God, the son of Mary by the Holy Spirit, but again reiterates what Matthew's saying about David, an heir to David's throne. Now, the key thing to remember here is the Messiah was foretold that they would be born of David's line. Uh, Matthew stresses that um, Joseph is a direct descendant of David. 
David was seen as the ideal king by most Jews. So that's, the, that's why David is mentioned so often. When we look at the names and titles, there are some similarities and some differences between the two gospel accounts. Matthew uses the word Messiah frequently. The phrase Emmanuel, which literally translates as God with us. We get King of the Jews. We get a ruler who is shepherd to Israel. We get the fact that he's a Nazarene. Whereas Luke, as well as using the same title, Jesus, son of the most high God, great, holy, full of wisdom, a saviour, Messiah again, a light for the Gentiles and for the glory of Israel. And again, I've mentioned this before, the characters that are emphasised in the two seem to be different. I think it would be true to say that Matthew is a much more male orientated gospel. The key protagonists there are men. King David, Joseph of Nazareth, the Magi from the East, King Herod, the chief priests and the scribes. Whereas we look at Luke's gospel, it mainly centres around women, the Virgin Mary, uh, Elizabeth, Anna. And actually, it's looking at the lower class in society, the poor, the aged, people like the shepherd, Simeon, Zechariah, as opposed to the royalty and the higher parts of society in Matthew's gospel, such as King Herod, the chief priests and the scribes. So there's a different emphasis on which characters uh, play a key part. Other themes in Matthew involve things like obstacles, conflict, fear, murder and politics. Whereas Luke is much more concerned with glory and praise and joy, uh, poverty, humility, faith. And there are very clear Old Testament parallels in both gospel. The fact that Matthew has the angel appearing to Joseph, uh, to, um, Joseph in a dream um, would also um, echo the idea of uh, the Joseph of the Old Testament as in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat fame, the famous dreamer. The slaughter of the innocents may echo the story of, the, of Moses, uh, the lawgiver who freed, the, uh, freed God's chosen people from the slavery of Egypt. So what Matthew may well be doing is drawing Old Testament parallels here with Jesus. Whereas Luke is much more concerned with stories such as the birth of Samson and the birth of Samuel, um, this is more about um, barren women having the um, being able to give birth, uh, chosen people, uh, chosen people who have a close relationship with God. So those are your theological emphasis within the two gospel accounts. And what I've also done for you, and again, you can look at this in more detail yourself. I've gone through Matthew's gospel, having you know, said about all these Old Testament prophecies that Matthew is at pains to emphasise. What I've done is I've given you some of the quotations from Matthew and I've given you on the other side the Old Testament text that they relate to. So, for instance, to give you an idea, if we take this one here in Matthew 2, 5 to 6, we have Matthew saying in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's written by the prophet, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. So what Matthew is doing is quoting an Old Testament prophecy that said the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. And that prophecy is Micah 5.2. You, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me, one is to rule Israel. So you can see the two parallels. So there are your quotes from Matthew. There are the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah that Matthew is alluding to. Hopefully that makes sense and you can look at that in more detail. So let's talk about historical accuracy then. Are these Gospels historical works or are they more than that? Or are they a combination of the two? So let's start with Matthew's Gospel and Herod's massacre of the children of Bethlehem. Now, surely, if you had a king in Bethlehem 2000 years ago, massacring children, that would make it into the writings of most historians. Now, it doesn't do so. There is no mention of it by contemporary historians. And this casts some doubt 
as to whether Matthew is actually writing an historical account. Matthew may have invented it to show that similarity between Jesus of the Old Testament and uh, so Jesus and Moses of the Old Testament. Pharaoh slaughtered the firstborn of the Israelites. Moses survived. Moses went on to give the Israelites the law who saved them from the oppression of Pharaoh, who brought them to the promised land. In the same way, Jesus brings a new law. Jesus is a new saviour for his chosen people, not just the Jews, but for all. Maybe that is what Matthew was trying to do by including that story. Okay. However, on the other side, some historians have commented that Herod was not exactly the nicest of people. He did actually kill three of his own sons. So whilst it may not be mentioned by contemporary historians, it is nevertheless possible. It does fit in with his character profile. Luke really stresses the point that his account is historically accurate. But there are some issues with that. For instance, his chronology of Jesus' birth appears to be mistaken. He says that Quirinus was the governor of Syria at the time, but we know that he governed Syria uh, from 6 CE to 12 CE. So that is after the good eight years, uh, eight years at least after the birth of Jesus. But it can't be proved he was the governor in the days of Herod, okay? Because we know Herod died in 4 CE. So he's got his dates wrong. It's possible that it was a previous scribe who wrote the wrong name down because we know that Saturninus was the governor of Syria at the time of the birth of Jesus. And maybe it's possible that just the wrong name was, was written down. Other people have argued that just because Quirinus was governor of Syria between these dates doesn't mean that he couldn't have been the governor at another date, but we just it just hasn't been written down. However, you make up your own mind on that. The other key thing in Luke's gospel is this um, this census. Um, there's no there's no census whatsoever that we are aware of in six or seven CE. It's also been claimed that the three hymns um, in Luke's gospel were actually in use prior to him being, it being written. So Luke may be in error in ascribing those to Mary, Zechariah, and Simeon. Again. That's up to you to make your decisions on that. But all of these add grist to the mill that perhaps these are not historical accounts. The other thing that people say, some of the supernatural accounts in the Gospels, uh, the fact they're in included sort of does uh, call the historicity into, um, into doubt. Maybe they are not meant to be historical accounts. You know, constant apparitions by angels, you know, to Joseph three times, to the wise men in Matthew. In Luke, the Gabriel appearing to Mary, Elizabeth's unborn child leaping in the womb when she encounters the Messiah, Simeon and Anna are in the temple. Uh, and most of all, the account of a virgin birth. These miraculous accounts cast doubt on whether there is historic historicity in these two Gospels. But again, you make up your own mind what you think on this. But what this does is it does explain why we get conflicting views and models present in later Christianity. Because what you have is this wrestling to explain how Jesus can be both human and divine at the same time. And it causes a bit of a misunderstanding and that's why there are conflicting views within Christianity because of this um, dichotomy within the accounts. So, We've looked at the similarities. We've looked at the differences. How do you harmonize? Is it possible? Well, one such one theory that could go some way to solving this issue is redaction criticism. You have to know this. It's part of the syllabus. So we're going to do this in a little detail. Hopefully this will make sense. So redaction criticism in a nutshell is the theory that the New Testament writers altered existing materials about Jesus to suit their own agenda. So what redaction criticism is saying is, okay, when Matthew wrote his gospel, 
he had a specific agenda in mind. He might have been writing to a specific audience. He might have had specific themes that he wanted to get across to that audience. Luke may have had a completely different thing in mind. He may have had a completely different audience in mind. He may have had a completely different message that he wanted to get across. And this is why there are differences between the two. They might have both used the same source, but each of them chose to put their own interpretation onto that source to suit their ends. So redaction criticism is a type of historical criticism, and it's doing what I said earlier, it's focusing how a, an author uses a source, then their editorial choices. And what you try to do as a redaction critic is you look at those choices and try to make sense of the themes, or in this case, the theology, dear to the author. What is the key message that author is trying to get across? If two writers access the same source, but tell the story in different ways, then you can use redaction criticism. And actually, it'd be true to say that even those writers don't have access to the same source, but share a common theme, you could still make educated guesses as to their biases. So, we've seen that the narratives of Luke and Matthew contain stories that are arranged, redacted, for a theological purpose. In contrast, the earliest Gospel of Mark, written around 70 AD, contains no birth stories at all. So Mark obviously didn't think it was necessary to have a birth narrative in. Now, possibly, we have an issue arising here. How do you find out the author's purpose in writing the Gospels? Why was it that Matthew and Luke inserted birth narratives where Mark does not? Remember, Matthew and Luke and Mark are known as the synoptic Gospels, that synoptic meaning similar. All three Gospels are extremely similar. Virtually every single passage in Mark appears in Matthew and Luke. So it's very clear that Matthew and Luke copied from Mark and added bits of their own. But the bits, the big bits that Matthew and Luke added are the nativity story. Why did they choose to do it? Now, you could make the following observation. This is what some redaction critics do. Okay, if you line up those passages in Mark and Luke, uh, sorry, Matthew and Luke, what do you see? What do the observations tell us? Okay, what's the driving force, the gist of the narrative? Okay. And if you look at that, as we've done previously with those two charts that I put up for you, showing the different themes, etc., we can see the message of the two Gospels is a little different. So let's start with Matthew's Gospel. What is Matthew driving at? Well, it's really clear that he is obsessed with this idea of scripture fulfillment. Okay? And the scriptures he is referring to are the Old Testament scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, which tell of a Messiah who would come, a shepherd to Israel. So one such messianic passage is Isaiah 53, who mentions all we like sheep have gone astray, the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. Now, at the time of writing, at the time of Jesus, or not at the time, at the time of Jesus, and at the time of writing the gospels, even 40, 50 years after the death of Jesus, Israel was an occupied nation under the Roman Empire. The Jews hated the occupying Roman force. They saw the Messiah as a military leader, a military leader that would overthrow the Romans by force and establish God's kingdom on earth in Israel with the Messiah as the head as the ideal king, like King David. The Christian notion of the Messiah, in the case of where we're first starting out, Matthew, who was a Jew, and the early Christians were all Jews, is the idea that they, the Messiah is a very different concept. He's not a warlike Messiah. He's not a, a military figure. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom set in Jerusalem with a king like David at its head. The kingdom of God is for all people, for Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews. The Messiah is not a military leader. It is a suffering Messiah who doesn't conquer the Roman Empire, 
who conquers sin. That is absolutely key. And what Matthew is trying to do in his gospel is show a Jewish audience that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah and is the Messiah that was foretold in the Old Testament. So it's aimed, Matthew's gospel is aimed at Jewish readers. It comes from a Jewish viewpoint, Joseph's viewpoint, connected to King David, fulfilling those Old Testament prophecies. Make no doubts about it, readers of Matthew's gospel. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah that was foretold in Old Testament prophecies. He's coming to the world, not just for Jews, but for all people. And let's not forget that in Matthew's gospel, the first visitors to visit Jesus were the wise men from the east. They were Gentiles, they were non-Jews. He is a savior for all mankind, not just his chosen people, the Jews. Luke's gospel, much longer and very different. He is much more interested in Jesus being a light to lighten the Gentiles, as in um, the, um, the quote from the Nunc Dimittis that I've used here, Simeon's um, words. Luke, we know, was probably Paul's friend, the writer of Acts, and he is a non-Jewish writer. He wrote, his, uh, he wrote in Greek. He, when he quotes from the Old Testament, he's using the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. So he is a Gentile, and it's quite clear that he's writing for a Gentile audience. He's writing from Mary's viewpoint. He doesn't stress that link to David. And why would he? Because a Gentile audience wouldn't understand it. They haven't been brought up in a Jewish culture. They haven't been brought up in, um, in, the, in the Jewish country under Roman occupation um, where the religion is being repressed. They wouldn't understand Old Testament prophecies. They wouldn't understand the significance of King David. So Luke doesn't labour that point. Instead, he emphasises the fact that Jesus is a Messiah for all people, specifically the Gentiles. He focuses on Jesus being a Messiah for the poor, the underprivileged. Let's not forget that in Luke's gospel, the shepherds are the first to visit Jesus. Poor, lonely, poor people. Mary and Joseph, they are in poverty, lying in a manger, no room at the inn. Matthew, they're in a house. Whilst Luke stresses the prominence of John the Baptist, there's a reason for doing that. Now, you might argue that John the Baptist story has got a bit of a Jewish flavour, but Luke's doing this quite deliberately. What he's saying is Luke you know, Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament revelation. John the Baptist in Luke's gospel is representing the last of the Old Testament prophets, but it's made really clear that he is no match for Jesus. Jesus is something greater than these Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets, let's move them to one side for Luke, and now it's Jesus. That is what one focuses on. So the gist is different. The driving force of the narrative is not Old Testament scripture fulfilling Old Testament prophecy as in Matthew, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, Ezekiel speaks of an age when God will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, an age of the Messiah. So Mary is told by the angel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And Simeon is filled with the Holy Spirit when he prophesies that Jesus will be a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. So no longer are just the Jews the chosen people. Christianity, this new branch of Judaism, is a religion for all nations, for Gentiles as well as Jews. And that is the gist of Luke's Gospel. And when we have these um, hymns that Luke puts out, such as Mary's Magnificat, what Luke is doing is echoing some of the Old Testament. So he doesn't completely forget the Old Testament, but he doesn't labour it as much as Matthew does. And all I've done here is I've got Mary's Magnificat here, which is clearly echoing uh, Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 10. 
And what I've got is the two passages here. And I've just highlighted in different colours some of the similarities between the two. And so if you were a Jew reading Math uh, Luke's Gospel, you would pick up some of those uh, references in the hymns to the Jewish Old Testament. But again, it's not nearly on the scale that Matthew is using. And you can study that to your heart's content. So what that hymn is doing is basically stressing the link between the former times and the new age of the Messiah. He quotes Hannah's song in Samuel, moves on to Mary's Magnificat. It's a new age. It's different. We've moved on from God being just the chosen people of the Jews. Um, it's a God of fulfillment. Themes of the hungry being filled, the rich being cast down, a new justice, an age of plenty, a new kingdom, but not a kingdom set in Israel, a kingdom across the whole world. And finally, we can identify where Luke and Matthew put their own little commentary in as writers and making their own little personal points of view. So, for example, when Luke speaks of Simeon being moved by the Holy Spirit, he's deliberately inserting that. He's making authorial comments and he's adding to the narratives this idea of moved by the Holy Spirit. He's bunging that in because he wants to emphasise the role of the Holy Spirit. When Matthew is saying scriptures are being fulfilled, he's adding his own gloss on the story. He's making authorial comment. OK, and you can see that as a redaction criticism, uh, as a redaction critic, and you can draw those inferences, those conclusions from that. And I think it's always good to have a key quote. Uh, this is Steve Moyes. Uh, and he says, redaction criticism suggests that we have in the Gospels four portraits of Jesus, which are written to influence a particular group of readers or hearers. And that sums it up very nicely indeed. So can you harmonise those two? Well, redaction criticism, I suppose, does go some way to that if you want to use that. Well, it doesn't go some way. It does. Um, so you can use that as one of your arguments. But basically, I think you can say, well, yes, you can harmonise them if you choose to believe that the Bible doesn't contain clear differences. It is possible to make a case that the authors use different sources from the same account. And these sources simply report on different facts that were all part of the event. Maybe there were shepherds and wise men that came to see Jesus. It's just that Matthew chose to include one and Luke chose to include the other and they both missed the other one out. It is possible. You can say yes if you hold a traditional view of the Bible. You know, the traditional view of the Bible being uh, it's the word of God. God doesn't make mistakes. Therefore, it is factually accurate. OK. You would have to take, if you held that belief, you would have to take a point, that point of view that the two nativity accounts could be harmonised. Or you can go, no, you can go, sorry, there are simply too many differences between the accounts for it all to be true. Now, in an exam, you're probably going to get a question that asks you to evaluate this. Can the two nativity accounts be harmonised? And there are a number of different arguments you can use. So you can use the redaction criticism is successful in doing it. You could use this in the fact that, you know, that there are clear differences. So you could um, possibly um, give a reasons why the differences um, to explain away the two differences. You can use that argument. I don't think it's a particularly strong one, but you, you can. Because um, it's hard to argue uh, much more than, well, God says it, so it must be true. Um, and then you can make some good points on the no. So what I've done here, and you, and you make your own decision as to how you're going to evaluate that and what your personal viewpoint is. No one's right or wrong with these sort of things. These are some of the things that you might choose to mention for one side of the argument or the other. So you might consider as I said before, that the accounts don't directly contradict each other. There's no reason why they can't be true. Perhaps they had access to different information that wasn't available to the other. Or you could say that, you know, maybe the sources they used were different. I mean, Luke may have received his account of Jesus' birth directly from Mary herself. And that would explain why he focuses on her perspective, why he's able to describe the Annunciation, why he could talk about the visit to Elizabeth, the presentation of the temple. Maybe Matthew didn't have access to that source. Or 
you could also reconcile other different elements of the story. I've already said, you know, why couldn't it be that Jesus was visited by both shepherds and magi? You know, Mary, Joseph and Jesus could have fled to Egypt after Jesus' presentation in the temple. That would explain the slight difference with the timeline. Um, you, I don't know why these aren't introducing one at a time. I apologise for that, but let's do them one at a time. Um, you could stress the similarities in the account, you know, that both stress he was born in Bethlehem at the time of Herod to Mary, who was betrothed to Joseph. There was an immaculate conception by the Holy Spirit and he was the Messiah of Old Testament prophecy. You could stress the fact that the infancy narratives are not historical. Some, write, um, some theologians claim that the writers move back the moment of Christian recognition of who Jesus is to his birth and conception. So it may have been that just before uh, the Gospel writers were writing, 70 CE onwards, that um, prior to that, the church was of the opinion that Jesus um, became, um, his, his godhood was bestowed at the point of baptism. Um, prior to that, maybe a heresy existed that he was man before that. Maybe Matthew and Luke are putting the narrative, the birth narrative in to counteract that view and show that he was, um, he was um, God from the point of birth and conception to counteract that argument. If you're having problems with the time scales, you've got to reconcile the visit of the Magi. You could say, as I've said before, that that happened two years after the birth of Jesus. OK, so you've got to you've got to reconcile some of those things. Also, this return to Nazareth from from um, from to Bethlehem. There is a problem with that. How you reconcile that is up to you. Uh, the locations provide some issues. Matthew, the family homes in Bethlehem, their journey to Egypt and settled in Nazareth, whereas it appears to be the opposite in Luke. That might these two might be a strong argument against them being historical. You could look at the different emphasis on the characters, Matthew, Herod and Magi, Luke, Elizabeth, Zechariah, the shepherds, etc. You could look at the different perspectives of the two Gospels, Matthew focusing on Joseph, Luke on Mary. Remember, Judaism at the time was a very paternalistic religion, so men were seen as uh, the people that were responsible for the worship of God. So Matthew, as writing to a Jewish audience, is much more likely to feature a male as the key protagonist and therefore uses Joseph. Um, and we talked about this, the fact that they are meant for two different audiences, a Jewish audience and a Gentile one. OK. Maybe you could argue, I mentioned this uh, prior, that Matthew and Luke were trying to prove something that was not actually believed in by other New Testament writers, the divinity of Jesus prior to baptism. These accounts maybe were introduced to make it clear that Jesus was fully divine. Otherwise, it could be believed, which would be heretical, that Jesus was fully human and only attained to divine aspect at his baptism. Up to you to make your decisions on that. So, there we go.